Okay. Um, <clears throat> it was a great deal of fun putting together the list, and I wanted to end it <clears throat> with kind of a you know, the real big picture, which is why I thought of the Drake equation. And I asked a uh, friend of mine, a neighbor who lives around the block from me, if he knew anyone who was in into astronomy. My friend Dave often goes to the Cranford Planetarium. And he put me in touch with Aaron. Aaron is the president of the Amateur Astronomers uh, Association. I believe they're based in Cranford. He is a, a BS in mathematics. He's going to talk about the Drake equation. And the part that I think relates to the environment is the one variable, which I'm sure Aaron will touch on, about the length of time that they think civilizations last. And with some of the things we were hearing about this summer, I'm sure Aaron will really highlight that for us. So Aaron, please proceed. And thank you so much for stepping in. You don't know me from Adam, but we both know Dave. And uh, I'm, I appreciate uh, Dave and you for uh, helping me put this final uh, program together today. Oh, thank you, Eric. And it's, it's fun to be here. So let me share screen so you can actually see what I'm talking about. So the question is, are we by ourselves? And this question has been a a topic of human discussion since there have been humans, right? It's not a question of, it's not a modern question, right? Are we alone? That is, this is something that humans have been asking uh, since the dawn of time. Now, what that alone means, its context and its scale has changed, right? From, you know, your biblical uh, post-flood, are we the only humans left on earth because we're the only ones on the boat? Or to today, are we the only ones in the universe? And it's a, it's a fundamental question that keeps gnawing at people. And in the 1960s, with the in invention of, you know, the space race and actually technology that we could actually see into outer space with great clarity, the question was, can we just, like, try to get a ballpark estimate so that's what Frank Drake did, is this equation is by no means meant to be definitive. It's meant to be back of the envelope, quick, hey, do we even think it's possible that somebody else is out there that we can talk to? And he was in particularly uh, concerned with talk to. Uh, he was one of the founding members of the SETI project, which is still ongoing which is a search for extraterrestrial communications, right? The search for extraterrestrial intelligence, but they're really looking for those that communicate, right? Doesn't matter how smart they are, if they can't talk to us, we don't know they're there. So that's what we're gonna to discuss today. And this is not going to be a me talking to you talk. This is going to be an us figuring it out together talk. So we're gonna go through each of the parameters of the equation, and we are together going to come up with three scenarios, a best case scenario, a worst case scenario, and then what we think of as average. If you wish to speak, raise your hand and someone will unmute you or you can put your comments in the chat. I'll be monitoring those as well. Um, so we're gonna be discussing each of these aspects and there is no right or wrong answer for any of them, right? We're just gonna go with, hey, what do we think? And at the end, we'll go through, I have an Excel spreadsheet that'll do all the math for us. And I'll give you what the current best estimate is for uh, the numbers in the Drake equation. So let's go through them. All right. So what do we even need to know about? This is what Frank Drake came up with. N equals R dot F P dot N E dot F L dot F I dot F C dot L. What does that even mean? We'll go through each of those individually, but we just need to know that N is the number of communicative civilizations in our galaxy right now. So here's what each of those means. This R value is the rate at which stars form in the galaxy. So how often do they, um, do we get new stars on a yearly basis? 
then we need to know what is the fraction of those stars that have planets? Can't have intelligent light if, if they don't have a place to stand. The number of the planets per system that are Earth-like. Now, we'll talk about what that means by, quote, planet and what means by, quote, Earth-like. Um, but it was assumed in 1960 that you had to have a planet and that it had to be like Earth. Right? We're assuming that life evolved here for a reason, so let's assume that that's a good place to start. What fraction of those Earth-like planets actually end up developing life? What fraction of that life ends up becoming intelligent? And that's a question for debate what that means. Uh, what fraction of that intelligence ends up being able to develop communication? And then the last one, which is a one I think we might spend the most time talking about, is the lifespan of how long that civilization can communicate. Uh, question, what does he mean by right now? So like right now. Um, so yeah, it, let's assume non-relativistic, right? Let's take the naive approach of right now, which is if we could stop the clock of the galaxy this instant and we just sort of froze it in time and sort of poked around, what, how, what does that mean? Again, this was very back of the envelope. He wasn't thinking about relativistic distances or how long is it going to take for light to travel back and forth. Um, so yeah, that's what he was going for. It's just the, at this instant, a very naive approach of what the instant means. So, uh, normally I give this talk to people who don't know scientific notation, because we may end up using some. Just know that if you have, right, a really big number, you get a positive exponent. If you have a really small number, you get a negative exponent. So if we wanted to write 4 billion, right, that would be 4 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. If we wanted that to be 1, 4 billionth, Put negative. Ah, do plans include moons? We'll get there. So, next thing we'll need to know is what is a fraction and how are we going to represent them? Right? I'll gloss over this quickly. Right? Probabilistically, we're going to say that something with a probability of one is always going to happen something with a probability of zero is never going to happen. We can assume, since we are all sitting here, that none of our numbers will be zero. Because if it was, we wouldn't be sitting here. So we're going to say that you know, 0.5 is 50-50, 0.1 is 1 in 10, 10 to the negative third is 1 in 1,000. And again, I'm not going to tell you these numbers. You'll tell me. All right, so the first thing we need to know is the rate that stars form in the galaxy. We know this, it's kind of seven. Sometimes you'll see 10, sometimes you'll see less, but we're just gonna go with seven. That's the best number that we have. And that's not really something that we can sort of on our own discuss and take into consider and to think about. That's just really, you need a degree in cosmology. So we know that the rate at which stars form the galaxy is about seven a year, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you figure they're around for billions of years, if not a trillion years, some of them, um, that's, that's a lot. So the first thing we actually have to discuss is what fraction of stars have planets? Now, remember, we're going to take a best guess, like a best case scenario, so the highest number, the worst case scenario, the lowest number, and then we're just going to find some number in the middle. So I will open this up to everybody. Uh, feel free to chat in the discussion or to ask yourself to be unmuted. What do we think? 
what do we think? What fraction of stars will end up with planets? You can raise a hand if you'd like, anybody, or chat. 10%? Say one in 10 stars has, a, has a, at least one planet on it. 85%, someone's being more optimistic, 20%. I think most. 85, one in a billion? Wow, someone is really, really did not have their coffee this morning. <laughs> one in a billion, one in 10 billion. Uh, so if we, so the, so Bill, uh, we're not asking the number of planets, we're asking if they have them or not. Um, so your use our solar system is, uh, we'll use that in the next slide, 80%. All right, so point one. All right, so I'm seeing that. I'm just going to write these down. Uh, best guess, I got, there were a couple of people that said 85. 90%. Worst case scenario. Let me scroll back through. 20%, 10%. I got a couple 10%. We'll take that as, let's take that as the low number. And then just for convenience, let's just say half of them as being on average. So, all right, we're gonna say that 80, best case scenario, 85% of stars have planets. Worst case scenario, 10% of stars have planets. And on average, we're just gonna say about half of them. Well, here's some more information. We know that at least 10% of typical stars have planets, right? We can, we can say that based on just how many we've seen, right? You look at a patch of sky, you say, hey, we know that at least 10% of these have planets we can see. Um, infrared studies have suggested that that number could be somewhere between 20% and 50%. But again, our methods for determination of whether a star has a planet are limited, right? We can't see it. So one of two main methods is used. Either we stare at a star for long enough and a planet goes in front of it and it gets dim for a bit and then moves away and gets bright again. And this happens periodically. We say, well, there's, you know, we can calculate, we know how big the star is, we know how, what the, uh, amount of the light goes down is so we can say hey it must be a planet right this isn't a comet this isn't a dust cloud this is we know this is a planet we also know that large planets can make their stars wobble gravity works in both directions right you pull on the earth just as much as the earth pulls on you the only difference is is the earth's a lot bigger so you don't notice you pulling on it but if you get a star with a significantly large enough planet you can notice that pull, that wobble. And we can actually detect the star wobbling back and forth. If we were far out in the galaxy, a couple hundred light years away, we were looking at our solar system, we could actually detect the star wobbling because of Jupiter's influence. Right? Jupiter is the next biggest thing in the solar system. It's basically the star of Jupiter and then some dust and some junk that's floating around as far as mass is concerned. So we would be able to detect the wobble of our own solar system. So I think our numbers are, very, are pretty reasonable. What is a typical star? Ooh, that's a good question. So we're gonna talk about like stars that, so we're not talking about hypervelocity stars, so nothing that's been ejected from the galaxy. Uh, stars that aren't, circling around the black hole at the center of the galaxy, right? Because those don't have planets because they would have been ripped apart. So basically us, a star that's sitting there somewhere comfortably in the suburbs. All right, next discussion point. The number of Earth-like planets per solar system. 
What do we think? Number of Earth-like planets in the solar system. Let's ask two questions first. One, what does it mean to be Earth-like? Uh, yes, we are limiting our discussion to our own galaxy because we did the, the first number R was the number of stars formed per year in the galaxy. What does it mean to be Earth-like? <laughs> right, what, is that, what does that mean? Does it mean that we have, does it have to have water? Does it have to have an atmosphere? Does it have to be in the right temperature zone? Right? How many Earth-like planets are there in our solar system? <laughs> One in a million, three, half a planet on average. One in a thousand. One or two out of eight. So here's the interesting thing. The, the number for our solar system is probably four. Earth, Mars, Europa, possibly Venus if it wasn't quite so hot. Right? Venus is close. Right? There could be life on Titan, Saturn, Saturn's moon, even though it's cold and it's all methane. So in our solar system, we really have a chance for three. One we know of, Mars, which we're pretty sure had water at some point, and Jupiter's moon Europa. Ah, magnetic field, that's an important. Right, an Earth-like planet, right, to be considered quote unquote Earth-like or hospitable to life would have to have a magnetic field, otherwise you get zapped by cosmic radiation and UV. Absolutely. So we including in this word, so in, in the 1960s, the word planet just meant planet. Right. When he wrote this and he said planets he meant like the eight or nine at the time planets that we have but we've learned now that moons are just as likely right moons around gas giant planets are just as likely as a full-fledged planet to have conditions suitable for life uh do we consider earth like to be in the goldilocks zone yes we do However, that zone is getting larger and larger. Um, every, every sort of time the, they say, well, yeah, but if you include the fact that, hey, what if we put Venus where Mars is, right? Would that be warm enough? Yes, right? Venus is very, very thick carbon dioxide atmosphere, keeps it warm. That's why it's the hottest planet in the solar system. Right? Mercury isn't the hottest, even though it's the closest, because it has no atmosphere. Venus is hot enough to melt lead on the surface because of all the CO2. So if you, put, if you swap Venus and Mars, uh, you, know, you might have a good chance there. Um, are there other chemistries that could support life? We don't know. Some chemists and um, astrobiologists believe that Silicon based is possible. Um, but as far as we know, carbon based is the most likely given carbon's relative abundance and its ability to form complex structures. Anyone who's taken organic chemistry knows what I'm talking about. When I say uh, carbon is complex <laughs> chemistry and uh, dissolves in water. So all that stuff is water soluble. Does it need tectonic plates? We don't think so. Um, tectonic, tectonic plates are great, but not necessarily required. Again, we don't know for sure. Um, so yeah, we could include non-carbon. Absolutely. I, again, silicon is, is the, the considered the best next, the next best choice. So Taking all these things into consideration, right? There's one more thing that we, um, you know, I'll bring that up in the next section. 
need a variety of elements. Right. So that planet would have to exist around a second generation star. So stars come in two generations. We'll be, I'll, I'll gloss over this here, but you have first generation stars that are entirely hydrogen and helium. They formed from essentially the gas from the Big Bang, and they've been around for a very long time. You have second generation stars like our sun, which form from glass, gas cloud regions after the explosion of other stars. Those stars, when they explode, fuse and eject every element heavier than helium into the universe. The planet forms from the same region of gas and dust as the star. So it would need to be a star that has that is second generation and you would be able to detect you know, iron and oxygen and silicon and all that, uh, and nitrogen in the star spectrum. So we do need a variety of elements, but we've already assumed that those um, stars have formed planets. So that variety of elements has been taken into consideration in the last slide. All right, so let me scroll back up. Feel free to add, um, the number of, if anybody wants to comment, a number of planets. Let's see, we're saying three, half, one or two, a fourth. One to five, Earth-like planets. One Sorry, what was that? One and four. So we're looking for a number. So, so one to four or one fourth of a planet on average. So how many planets? Not what fraction that planet, but how many, the number? 25%. All right, so um, somebody was optimistic with five. Uh, someone was not quite so optimistic at a half and we'll just put two in the middle. All right. So the consensus was two. On average. Okay. Which is, which is reasonable considering um, that in our solar system we have Two and a half. All right, so the fraction of planets that end up having life of some kind. So all we're talking about is life of some kind, some bacteria floating around somewhere or something, right? We're not talking about vertebrate life. We're not talking about humans or dinosaurs, we're just talking about something we would poke at and go, that's alive. Question becomes, what does it mean to be alive in the first place? 80%, Mitch thinks 80% have life. Would viruses count? Would you count a virus? If we went, if we found a virus on Mars, would that count? Harvey says half. So Earth-like planets, what's the chance of it developing life? A virus is not alive. It is, it is considered not, you are correct. 0.1% um, Ooh. <laughs> Al, do we need matter for life? We're going to assume so. 50%, 60%, point, uh, 10 to the negative 7. Ten percent one percent All right, anybody else want to chime in? 0.2% or 20%. I don't know what you, what you meant there, Steve.
All right, let's see. What was the biggest one we found? Someone said, someone said 60. Let's try that. We'll just, we'll go nuts. 60% of the large end. And then somebody said, I'll just take 0.2% of the low end. And we'll say somewhere in the middle, I don't know, 10. 30%. All right. So the fraction of planets with life that develop a intelligence. So we're asking now, if you have life of some kind, what fraction of those will become intelligent? Now, the question becomes what we determine as intelligent, right? How many intelligent species are there on Earth? Well, you could think, well, if you just say us, right, we're the only intelligent species. Someone says 1%. Uh, to have life, it must be sustained, just not appearing and disappearing. That's true. Mitch says 10 to the negative 6 chance of life becoming intelligent. So let's think about this. What does it mean to be intelligent? Does it mean using tools? Because if you, if you include using tools, then there's some birds that do that right they build sticks for getting grubs out of holes dolphins monkeys and apes Octo you can teach an octopus to operate a camera so it seems like if you we killed off other intelligent life at friend um so it seems like intelligence has, at least at our current time in the last, let's say, 100,000 years, popped up a few times, right? Us, Neanderthals, there's a bunch of the crow species, octopus, dolphins, chimpanzees. So 1%. Yeah, somebody said 10 to the negative six. Let's just use, we'll use that one just because it's totally out from left field and that's just going to be fun. And then who was the most optimistic? 30%, 20%. Let's say, let's be optimistic at 30. And on average, let's say one. All right. If it's intelligent, what fraction of it will develop the ability to communicate? Now, we first have to ask the question, what does it mean to be able to communicate? Right. It has to be able to communicate off planet. Right. Remember, this was the SETI project. So they're worried about talking to, you know, interplanetary communication. Currently, we only have one method of doing so radio. That's why the SETI project rents time on radio telescopes. That's the only method we use so far for interplanetary communication at all. Joe says 10%. Radio does include light, right? So it is EM, but we don't have anything powerful enough optically all right, so even if you think of an optical laser, right, the, the best we can do is get a, a laser to the moon and back. All right, so we're not, we're not going to get a laser all the way to uh, Pluto, for example. All right, so if you're communicating with the Voyager, tele with the Voyager probes, that's all done in radio. Because it's low enough power and it propagates well. So we, we really have only had the technology to communicate even within the solar system for about a century, right? The first real, the first broadcast broadcast into space was the 1939 Olympics. About 30, one of those, the ones in Germany. 
Uh, Mix is 10 to the negative six. Civilizations may be capable of intellectual communication, but will also have to be willing to do so. We're going to assume that they're willing to do so. Um, even if they're not willing, right? We send radio signals out into space all the time, and we're not intending to do so, right? We're not trying to communicate with ET. We just happen to be doing so because, you know, you can't send signals exactly to your satellite. 0.1%. So uh, another question is, let's imagine a world that was entirely covered with water and filled with the smartest dolphins you've ever seen, right? They're never going to develop the ability to communicate because, well, it's just water, right? You can't put it, you can't, you know, put a radio dish on, on the surface of the water, but they don't have thumbs. Hawking did warn against looking for life. Um, he was, I'll talk about him at the end if you remind me. So just because you develop an intelligent species doesn't mean that necessarily they're going to communicate. And I would agree with you that it seems unlikely, right? We can assume that the intelligent life that we've seen now is the only ones that have ever occurred. So let's say, let's be, Joe was optimistic when he said 10%. Uh, oh, I have to do a 10 to the negative six again. And we'll throw 1% in the middle. Again, we can play with these numbers in Excel as long as you like. All right, the last parameter, the one we're gonna probably spend the most time talking about. How long do they remain communicative? So let's talk about this from, we'll start with the environmental perspective. Let's take our own history. The first radio signal beamed out into space was in the mid to late 1930s. We almost blew ourselves up by the 1950s, right? We got really close a few times, certainly the Bay of Pigs, when we just almost blew ourselves to smithereens. So almost, I mean, we almost lasted 20 years ourselves. So... It could be quite short, right? Just because you are you develop the intelligence to create technology doesn't mean you have the intelligence to know how to use it safely, right? There's also the environmental question of if we can develop the technology to broadcast out into space, are we going to do what we're doing now and pollute ourselves into non-existence? Right. Will this technology generate overpopulation and pollution and climate change? Uh, depends on whether they have Jupiter to protect them from asteroids. Yes. Yes, Thomas, Jupiter and the moon, of course. Um, very important. 10,000 Earth years. I'm, that, I'm seeing that number a lot. Let's see. 10,000, 10,000, 1,000. So let's say I'll put 10,000 at the top end. Let's get some pessimists. What's a low number? How, how short do you think it could be? From the ability to communicate to you blow yourselves to hell. Aaron? Yes. Um Frank Drake, I think, made this equation uh, in the early 1960s. Yes. I think he was thinking of uh, that variable because we had developed uh, atomic weapons and there were two sides that were getting ready to use them, obviously. Yep. And he might have thought it might have been as short as maybe a couple thousand years. I mean, it took us a couple thousand years to... Um, 
go from agricultural to uh, atomic energy. And there's no reason to think that intelligent life forms on different planets would be the same variety. They, may, they might have uh, dark-skinned Martians and light-skinned Martians who can't get along. So I, you could I, easily uh, have a, a nuclear war. I think that's what Frank Drake was thinking of. That certainly is um, a, a consideration. I don't think he particularly was looking at it specifically from that perspective. This number is needed to finish the calculation. Mm -hmm. um, but the implications of this number are huge, right? Like I said, we, only, we, we almost lasted like 25 years before between the Nazi Olympics and the Bay of Pigs. Or the, Cuban, the Cuban Missile Crisis, maybe. Yes, yeah, that was the, the, the Bay of Pigs. So Mitch brings up a, a point, an excellent point that I was about to bring up, which is they grow so advanced, they can avoid us detecting with communicating with them. So not necessarily that they would choose to avoid, but if you develop something better than radio, wouldn't you use it? And if we're only looking in radio and you've developed some new technology, let's be Star trek -y people and say subspace communication, right? Some non-radio form of communication. You could be broadcasting right at us. We'd never know, <laughs> right? So this number of how long are you communicative is partially It was partially how long is the species going to survive without killing itself? And also how long are they going to use any one particular technology? Maybe they want to reach us and they assume we're primitive and they use radio to say, hey, look, they're, you know, the idiots over there on earth, they don't have this pro yet probably. So let's just talk to them in radio. Or they could say, Look at their radio communications. Do we really want to communicate with people like that? They watch our news shows. <laughs> yeah, could you imagine the first thing you saw from us was the 1940s? Lucy. I love Lucy. Yep. <laughs> it's like, what were the first, what were the first like five years of us broadcasting? Ricky. All, all of us trying to kill each other. Like, do we really want to get in that cat fight? I don't think so. So let's take the low number. Well, I'm going to be super pessimistic. We'll just say 25 for a really, really low number. And we'll see what that does. And somewhere in the middle, let's say 1,000, right? We'll just go with an order of magnitude here. All right. So we're going to, I'm going to switch tactics now. So you should be able to see the Excel spreadsheet. Let me know if you can't. You see it. All right. So let us be optimistic. We knew that that was seven. We said 85%, five. 30%, 10%, 10,000. All right, so column J gives you is the total number of communicative civilizations out there at this instant. All right. Again, we're ignoring time dilate, you know, we're ignoring how long it takes for light to travel, we're ignoring, we're ignoring all of that. The next column is a very crude approximation of how far it is on average between these civilizations in light years. Um, I came up with this calculation. Essentially, I took the area of the galaxy, <laughs> divided it by the number of civilizations, 
and then calculated the radius of a circle from that civilization. And that's the number you got, right? So I'm taking a lot of things into consideration. I'm assuming that the galaxy is flat, which it isn't, right? I'm assuming that everything's evenly distributed, which it isn't, right? Very crude, but it'll give you an idea. So 1,367 light years. That means if they sent us a signal in the year 800, it hasn't gotten here yet. And we send it, it'll be 1400 years before they get it and send a reply. Not very encouraging. So we just said seven for all these, we'll just do that. All right, on average, our average numbers, we said 50%, two, 10, 1, 1, and 1,000. Check your third column. I think you said two, but you typed five. I did do that, didn't I? I got to get some more. So, total number of civilizations currently is less than one. And they're really far apart. This pessimistic one's going to be great. Uh, let's see. Doesn't it like? Ugh. So essentially, none. Right. the The distance across the the, the diameter of the galaxy is only a hundred thousand light years. So this number is a little crazy but that's because we have two times 10 to the negative six, because that would just be fun. Um, so Rich, no, this result is currently. So when you take into consideration the rate times the time, the time cancels out and you just get a number. So, you know, number per year, you know, number divided by year times year, the years cancel. All right, let me give you the current, at least as far as when I last checked, best estimate. They've actually upped this number to 10 recently. All right, let's talk about each one of those. This number, they think that the galaxy is actually a little bit more active than they used to. We now think that basically every planet, every star has at least a planet. We're finding them absolutely everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's something. Between the Goldilocks zone being a thing and that zone ever widening and the ability to include things like moons, like Europa, a conservative estimate is that there should be at least one per solar system. Now that number is not as high as ours, because our solar system is surprisingly stable. 
Uh, ours is a bit of an exception in the fact that we have not had giant planets going roving all over the place, um, ejecting everything in its path. Uh, a lot of solar systems we find have a Jupiter-sized planet really close into the star, falling in, um, circling around in a couple of days as opposed to, you know, hundreds of days a year. Uh, so ours is surprisingly stable. Uh, current estimates say that if, if a planet can support life, right, has, has the right chemistry, has the, you know, has water on its surface, right? If it's Earth-like, it probably will. Now, what kind of life? Probably just bacteria or something similar. But it, the, the chemistry is, is, is almost too easy, right? There was an experiment done, I believe, in the 1970s, um, where they took a sealed system, put in what we believe to be the primordial soup that was on the surface of the earth three billion years ago, zapped it with electricity for a weekend and came back and found all sorts of complicated hydrocarbons. So even in the course of a weekend, the chemistry of carbon is such that it will start doing all sorts of interesting things on a very, very short time scale and is very reactive with itself. It dissolves well in water. So if you have liquid water moving about the place and there's plenty of carbon, you're probably going to get something that's going to self-replicate. The fraction that, det that determine that eh, develop intelligence, uh, half, again, this isn't my number. Um, where is this from? This is from a 2000 and nope. Yep, 2002 study out of uh, University of New South Wales where they suggested that intelligence is possibly exceedingly likely if it survives. The fraction of intelligent life that communicates, 0.95. Uh, the basis of this number, as I was reading, was the, if you're intelligent enough, you're going to be curious enough. And if you're curious enough, you're going to try it anyway. And that 5% of uncertainty leaves for things like water worlds where it's just not possible. Or um, let's say you live on a world like uh, Venus where the atmosphere is so thick that you can't see out of it. Right? If you can't see the stars, you may not even begin to worry about what's up outside of your atmosphere. You may not know that there's, you may not even think to think that there's anything out there. And the lifespan of 10,000 years is optimistic in my opinion um but they say if you get through the the what was called the teething phase which for us was the 20th century so far um eventually you should be able to develop technology enough that the conflict doesn't become a problem and you can solve your way out of all of your all of the um all of your problems with technology vis-a-vis -vis Star Trek. So that means that there would be 43,000 of these communicative civilizations right now. But even with as optimistic as this is, look at that number. On average, 483 light years away. That means if they were to talk to us, 
they would have had to have sent it during the reign of Queen Elizabeth for us to get it now. This is fascinating, Nancy. All right, the universe is a big place. Light travels really, really slow by comparison. Ah, I'm being poked to talk about Stephen Hawking's warning. Yes, so Stephen Hawking. You suggest that guy? Sorry, what was that? Steve Sadkowski gave me his name. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Hawking's warning. I'll summarize was we really shouldn't go looking. We have no reason to assume that any species we find would be any less aggressive than ourselves. And if they did have the ability to communicate and the ability to get here, we would be in big trouble. Right. The reality of it is, if aliens show up and they want to kill us, we have no choices. Right. This isn't going to be the movie Independence Day. <laughs> right. If they can get here, <laughs> right, they can obliterate us from orbit. And we have no choice. Right. We can't nuke them to death. We can't. There's just we, we have the, the technology difference would be so extreme. Right. You know, imagine sending the current U.S. military against cavemen. Sure, cavemen have spears. They can throw stuff at you. But we have tomahawks. <laughs> like, you know, we wouldn't even have to be on the same continent to blow you up. That's the level of, of technological difference that, that would be needed in order to get here. Because we can barely get off the planet. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We can send stuff to Mars. We can send little robots to Mars. And we can, we can send a little flying robot past, past Pluto. Sure. But we can send one, and they're tiny, and they're useless. So if you can, if you can travel the light year distances in some effective way, which we're not even sure is possible. Let's just start from, from that, right? Faster than light travel is probably not possible. We'd have no choice. So yeah, Stephen Hawking warned us that maybe we shouldn't be looking, just in case. But he also wasn't worried. <laughs> he, was, he personally was, was of the mind that they're never going to be able to get here, so I'm not really worried about it. We also have to discuss the, let's even assume, right? That we knew for a fact, we could poke at a star and say right there, 400 light years away is somebody we want to talk to, right? Which we're almost close enough to being able to do. Uh, the next generation of large ground-based telescopes will be able to detect um, the contents of the gases of the atmospheres of some of these exoplanets. And if they find O2 and O3, there's only one currently known way of getting O2 and O3 into an atmosphere. And that's if something's alive because O2 is just too volatile. It has to be continually replenished. So if we find it, it means that there's probably something alive down there. So even if we know that, radio can't make it. Right. Before I was I was waxing about the worries of the first broadcasts that we sent to the rest of the universe being World War II. I'm not worried. Those signals never made it out of the solar system in any coherent way. Right. Interstellar radi interstellar radiation is intense. Right. Our planet is protected by our own magnetic field. But the whole solar system is protected by both the sun's magnetic field and the fact that the sun is continually sending out charged particles outwards. It creates this envelope of charged particles that creates an envelope that keeps out 
cosmic radiation. It's called the heliopause, right? It's this place where the radiation from the sun and the interstellar radiation sort of even out and our sun's influence stops. Once you get past that, the radiation is so intense that a radio signal, even ignoring the fact that they propagate, right? They get, the farther they go, the weaker they get anyway, just because of the area that they're covering. Yeah, I'm not worried. I don't, I personally don't think we're going to hear anything from SETI. Because I don't think that radio is going to make it. And even if it could, who, if it, you could send a, sig a radio signal powerful enough, why would you send it in radio? Unless you specifically knew that we were here broadcasting in radio. But you wouldn't know that because our radio signals haven't made it out of the solar system. Do I think SETI is a waste of time? sort of personally, uh, but that's just me. So I hate to end on a disappointing note of basically saying it's just us. Um, but it's basically just us. So we have, uh, there's no, the joke is there's no planet B. We just have planet A, so we have to take care of it because there's no Vulcans coming to save us, <laughs> right? There's nobody who's going to charge to our rescue with replicators and, you know, fusion powered, you know, electric machines and, and, and all that sort of nonsense. It's just us. So. So Aaron, can, can I interrupt and, and uh, make a comment here? It's actually uh, 1127. So in principle, the meeting ends in three minutes. We, we often go longer if people want to keep talking and you're available and willing. Uh, our MC, who is Mitch Erickson, might <laughs> think it's important to stay on the time scale and he can weigh in on that. But I, I would like to I, I hope you will take a few moments before we close to talk about um, your organization. Yes. And and the observatory, which is in striking distance for us, and the programs, the public programs, even though they're suspended during COVID, I I really hope that we can get some of our guys over there and do some of those things. So I'd like to hear a little bit about it. Sure. So I'm president of an astronomy club called Amateur Astronomers Incorporated. We're one of the largest and oldest astronomy clubs in the on the East Coast. Uh, 200 members. We've been around since the 1940s. We operate out of an observatory on the campus of Union County College in Cranford. The observatory was custom built for us and donated to the college. Um, so the college maintains the physical building. We maintain the equipment and run the public programs. Uh, we have two telescopes, a 24 inch and a 10 inch telescope. Um, Pre-COVID, we were open every Friday from 7.30 to 10, um, but due to COVID, those regular Friday night programs have um, been suspended by the college who are not allowing um, the general public onto campus, which includes us, our members, and of course, the general public. We do, however, have a monthly lecture series from September through May, where we pay in a professional astronomer to give a talk. Those are still being held in person at the Roy Smith Theater at uh, the Cranford campus of Union County College. I will put up the, our website. Hang on just a second. It is loading. Come on. Oh, it's www.astrosm.org. Here we are. So this is our observatory. If you click under events, you go to our monthly meetings. This will send you to all of the information you need for our 
uh, monthly talks, which are on the third Friday of every month from September through May. And those are at the campus of Union County College. Uh, the club is pretty active. We do have a research committee that does research with the telescopes. Um, we do offer uh, an astronomy class for members where we, you get trained on the use of the telescopes. Um, so yeah, it's a fun club. Again, unfortunately due to COVID, the vast majority of our activities are um, restricted. We are still doing the Friday, the regular Friday programs via Zoom. So uh, follow us on Facebook or you can go right through our website and that'll give you links to our regular Friday programs, uh, which you can find via Zoom. So thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. And, and Paul indicated that I will resume the control, but uh, I, I do think it's important we give everybody a chance to ask any questions. You've seen a lot of chatter in the in the uh, chat, including things about science fiction and so forth. Uh, so you can maybe answer one or two of those, or our normal protocol is to uh, raise hands and uh, let's see, uh, Eric Hausker, you're the, you're the host for the speaker, so you call on the, the people. Oh, um, let me see. Um, who is their hand up? Uh, John Tomaszewski is first. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. John. Yeah, hi. Uh, great talk. I love that uh, equation. Uh, what do you think? If anybody watched 60 Minutes, uh, I think it was last time, they uh, supposedly got a government report that showed, uh, finally released that they're released pictures of uh, aliens, actually, or they think it might be aliens or Russians that are floating. What do you think about that? Is that a possibility that these people may have gone through the radio cycle and that kind of cycle and they're just coming through some kind of light bending uh, uh, process to fly their ships here and observe us just as you're trying to observe them with your telescope? Actually, no. Um, the, the government report said they could not exclude it being aliens. Um, but, you know, they also probably couldn't exclude it being Elvis Presley, <laughs> right? Um, it's hard to to exclude something like that. So they 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 said yeah, we just can't we can't rule it out. Um, uh, do I personally think that there are aliens here floating around? No, no. Um, uh, personally, why would they come here just to watch and then only be caught occasionally on a blurry video? Um, even if it is by a Navy pilot, what do I think those things are? I don't know, but I think that every time the explanation has tried to be aliens, it hasn't been. Well, you got to remember that Star Trek had the number one rule was they couldn't, uh, go to a, uh, or a alien planet that, uh, uh, had a, a culture less than what theirs was. True, but... Uh, Star Trek took a great lot of liberties with what's physically possible. <laughs> um, warp travel is mathematically not impossible. You just need to invent negative energy to be able to do so. And we don't like, we don't think that's a thing. We've never, you know, same with wormholes, they need negative energy to stay open. So faster than light travel, as far as our current understanding of physics is concerned, is impossible. So well, I my sir. Oh, can we move on to the next question? Yeah, of course. Next question. Go ahead. Who, who is it? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, you, you know, you, you mentioned having a, <clears throat> a magnetic field around the Earth. Um, I mean, our own solar system could have been very come very close to having life on other planets, at least, you know, at least bacterial life. Um, if you look at the Earth, it's got a magnetic field. It generates an inner and outer Van Allen belt. Uh, it's due to the fact that it has a liquid magnetic core that continually rotates and generates this. You know, they've studied the moon. They found out that the moon initially had a liquid iron core, but it, it froze solid. So I guess presumably there could have been a Van Allen belt around that. If you look at Mars, it, it, it doesn't have a magnetic field because it has a solid magnetic core. So if Mars would have had a magnetic core, and maybe in the beginning it didn't, it froze solid, 
it would have had its own Van Allen belts and it would have had an environment that would have protected life. Um, the three planets, there's, you know, Venus, Earth and Mars, they all had CO2 as an early atmosphere. So it took life to turn CO2 into oxygen, nitrogen, and it took about a billion years. And um, so even with that, within our own, you know, the reason Venus really can't support life is because it melts metal. It's too close and too hot, you know? Um, and I'm not sure if it has- Walt, Excuse me, Walt, but time is short. Um, are you leading up to a question? Um, well, <clears throat> You know, my point really is I have a little bit of a problem with the Drake equation because I don't think it includes enough factors, enough consideration, you know, to determine, you know, whether, you know, just because the planet's rocky and in the habitable zone and all that kind of stuff does not mean it's going to support life or have the possibility of life because the key is really having that magnetic core and having a Van Allen belt to protect the, you know, the development of life on the planet. The other thing that you didn't mention is, you know, stars come in all shapes and sizes. You have big red giants, you have hot white, hot white stars. So, so Wal, I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but you know, uh, if, if the question is, why should we have a Drake equation if it's not precise enough to be meaningful? That's a question that I think uh, Aaron can answer. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just wrapping up some of the, points that I think should be added. No, we don't have much time, so you have to hurry. Okay. And the other thing is the sun is part of a series of stars called, you know, the main sequence, and not all the stars are part of that sequence. So maybe that factor of seven is off. And there's only, out of the main sequence stars, there's only a small fraction, I think 10% that are yellow, which they think is more conducive to having the type of solar system that you know, would produce life. So I think there's a number of things. Walt, in, Walt what think, is your question? You're well, not supposed okay. to be giving a lecture here. <laughs> okay, do you agree with any of these things? Do you think the Drake equation should be modified? So I think it, it, it does its job very well, which is to be a back of the envelope sort of, should we even bother? And all of those individual considerations can be implemented in each area. So if you're worried about a planet having a magnetic field, well, that could be part of the Earth light. Or you could include that consideration when you say, well, from Earth like to having life. So there are ways to include all of that in each of those spaces. It's just they're very, very broad categories. Herb Waddell has a question, I believe. Herb, unmute. Uh, yeah. It seems to me that. Uh, well, first of all, I thought the Drake equation stimulated thought. This is my moment. And my question is, how does dark matter? I died on TED. Someone else got the mic? I just how muted a couple of people. Keep going. Into this? Uh, we don't know what's out there, really. So how do we know how uh, advanced civilizations might move through it or communicate through it. So, uh, dark matter is interesting. Uh, it doesn't really play a part except gravitationally. That's why it's dark. It doesn't interact with anything except gravitationally. So it's not, um, it's not something that anybody's looking at as far as being able to use to do anything. Uh, we don't even know what it is. Does but, gravity uh, exceed the speed of light? The no. gravity waves? No, nope. gravity propagates at the speed of light. So uh, you, gravitational waves, let's say, you know, the ones that are produced, that are detected by LIGO of colliding neutron stars or colliding black holes, those waves themselves propagate at the speed of light. So there's no way to, Einstein's equation doesn't really tell you you can't travel faster than the speed of light. What it really tells you is you can't carry information faster than the speed of light. Um, and a gravitational wave is you know, transferring information. So nothing that carries any information can travel faster than the speed of light with the exception of quantum entanglement, but that's another talk. And we have no idea how that works. 
That's great. So Al Aho, you're the last uh, raised hand. So I guess you get the last question. Well, Aaron, thank you for a great talk. It's always mind boggling to think about these things. My question is very simple. If Homo sapiens managed to wipe itself out, what's the current thinking on how long it would take for intelligent life to reappear on Earth? So, good question. Were, let's say we were to vanish, just the humans were to vanish tomorrow. How long would it take for another comparable species to evolve? It might not. We're really, really, really weird. Um, from an evolutionary point of view. And the fact that we've really, really gone down the big brain rabbit hole more than any other species ever has. Um, part of what allowed us to do that was the fact that everything was very stable for a very long time. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, there are, intelli there are other intelligent species now, ones that would be able to, to do anything comparable I'm not sure we'd ever, the planet would ever have that again, I think, or it would take at least, you know, millions of years. Thank you. You're welcome. So I guess uh, we hand it back to, uh, to Eric or Eric, to Eric, the microphone is yours. Eric, you have to unmute. There. What a stimulating hour it's been, and I think there was definitely mixed in an environmental message about trying to last longer <laughs> by controlling some of the things we do. So I, I hope that was clear to everybody, and it was meant to kind of round up the uh, or fill out the environmental month that we've had. Aaron, thank you so much, and I'm going to give a special thank to our, our common friend Dave for having gotten me in touch with you. And we have a screen share. Hold on a second. Steve, you want to say something about this? Sure, I'd be happy to. And again, uh, let me also thank Aaron for giving us a refreshing change today. Normally, we have people lecture to us, but today you sought to draw the answers from us. Um, Socrates would have been proud. Thank, thank, thank you, Aaron. And, thank you so much. Uh, we, have, we have two ways of thanking our speakers. Uh, the first is with the certificate of appreciation. You can see it on the screen there. Down in the lower left-hand corner is a Norcid, and it's down there because back in 1930, when the Old Guard was founded, the city of Summit was at the epicenter of the nation's orchid growing and distribution industry. And so our founders thought that that was the appropriate uh, logo for us. Uh, please understand it, it comes with, uh, with our appreciation and thanks. And our, our second way of thanking you is with uh, the uh, Old Guard salute. So if uh, everyone can be unmuted, Yay. Yay. Thank you all. Hey, thank, thank you, you Aaron. Thank you. And